Ladies and gentlemen, I, I wanted to welcome you very warmly back to this wonderful symposium and to this next session on a hot topic. Is Paris the new London? Now, before we were coming on to this session, I had a little exchange, email exchange, with Yusia Holmes and Sol Garcia Galan, the masterminds of Talking Galleries, <laughs> and we had a little discussion about, should we keep this title or not? You know, is Paris the new London? Mm. Is, that's a little bit of a strange title, which is a kind of fair question, but then I decided, no, no, please, can we keep it? Because it would get your attention and it would whip up a nice little debate, which is what we like <laughs> when we have a panel discussion. <laughs> and in case you're wondering why someone called Farah Nayeri should be talking about Paris and London, when I should be in Tehran burning my headscarf, <laughs> um, <laughs> I am a longtime resident of Paris, first of all, and a longtime resident of London. I, I moved to Paris when I was quite a young child and uh, lived there for a very long time. I have a French passport. But I have been living in London for more than 20 years now, so I can, I think, sort of look at the drawbacks and the advantages of both these cities. Um, and, uh, of course, in this panel, we do have two Frenchmen, um, I, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> and we also have uh, Giusy Raguza, who is Italian, but her gallery is uh, based in Paris. And, uh, and she is, lives in Paris. So, so I think we would get very dif differing perspectives. I also wanted to say, please prepare some questions because <laughs> we're not going to be sitting here talking for an hour and 20 minutes and then 10 minutes to you. I'm going to open it up to you halfway through, once we go through and have like a one round of um, exchanges. Um, so I went around last night preparing this talk, as I do, and I looked online for sort of sayings by famous people about London and about Paris. And um, about London, the 18th century British author Samuel Johnson said, when a man is tired of London, he is tired of life, for there is in London all that life can afford. <laughs> of course, this being the 20th cent 21st century, we would have said when a person rather than when a man, but never mind. Okay. Um, Oscar Wilde famously noted, the man who can dominate a London dinner table can dominate the world. Wow. And so these were kind of very um, complimentary comments about London. Then I looked for comments about Paris. And uh, um, Ernest Hemingway, no, sorry, Henry Miller, the author Henry Miller said, to know Paris is to know a great deal. Okay. Uh, Ernest Hemingway, in something that you probably heard, said, if you're lucky enough to have lived in Paris as a young man, then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays with you. For Paris is a movable feast. And finally, Audrey Hepburn, the quintessentially elegant actress, s subtly declared, Paris is always a good idea. So I thought I would turn and put that Audrey Hepburn uh, sort of saying to Juzi Raguza uh, of Galleria Continua, who, um, of course, your gallery ha is now has an outpost in Paris, quite an important outpost in Paris. And you, as far as I know, I don't see you in London. So um, can you tell us, Juzi, why Continua chose Paris? Yes. Um, actually, um, thank you for the question. Now, I prefer to speak with this because I'm Italian, so I will <laughs> use my hands for speak. We need more volume. We can't Do hear you. you. <laughs> ah, okay. Ah, yeah, sorry. maybe you should take okay. the earring off. Yeah. Sorry for this moment. <laughs> you just need to speak louder then. Prova. Okay. But I will put out also. The okay. No, that's all. So, um, actually, the, the story is more longer for this question, because the true questions f for us, and I say for us, because when you invite Galleria Continua, you invite all the groups. So I'm here like Juicy, but Continua is here. Um, so the, the true question for us is Paris can be the new Tuscany <laughs> and the new San Gimignano because 
Yes, we, we really chose this city in a special moment. I want to be honest with you. So I spent 14 years of my life to say, because we opened a space in the countryside of Paris, so a 50 kilometer of Paris, two old mills, very beautiful, with a public project, all people are invited to come to enjoy art. It was a very, um, is a very special project with a pedagogical program, et cetera, et cetera. So, I spend really a lot of time of my life to say we we never been in Paris because Paris is a, a capital, so a lot of things are in Paris, and who continue love to be in other place, in place where she can build other things. In yes, history. reminder that Continua is based in the gorgeous Tuscan town of San Gimignano. I'm sure most of you know. Yeah, uh, we we yeah. start from there. So, so I, I need to, sorry for this story, but she, she really um, chose the city where the tree founder was born, San Gimignano. So it's San Gimignano that chose Continua and con non Continua that chose San Gimignano. So it was a little bit the same for us. So when I, I, I spent 14 years to say, no, we will never be in Paris because uh, we do in a different way. We want to propose a different model in France uh, where all things are in the capital. We want, 15 years ago, I say, do something outside was very hard was a proposition um, very strong and we made it and in 2021 everything every really bookshop or uh, marketplace was closed and they told me so juicy we will open in paris I say what what i can say to all people that i say that we never be in Paris, and uh, you, the tree, the tree of Continua are are really dreamers. So, what they want to do in January 2021, it's install something that can be open because for two years we fight with something of close. Everything was close the art world was uh, stopped so we we stopped to travel we stopped to do things and this was for or other and something of crazy because we are all the time everywhere we we dream project we we met people all our stories is about met people so Paris was sad, and at this moment was very closed. And at this moment, so we, we think, let's open something of difference. So you open in 2021? Yes, in January. Yeah. That's an incredible time to open a gallery. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, but it's crazy, crazy. it's without uh, our models. And we chose Paris because in this moment, Paris was a place where we can do things in another way because all the references are lost, you know? Everything was closed. So we, we find a good moment for us to build something of different. Something new. Yeah. Guillaume, uh, you are the famous and very popular among you uh, director of uh, Art Paris. And of course, uh, you, are, you are someone who, like Alain, will know Paris extremely well. But kind of you, in, in our exchanges and emails, you were singing the, the merits of Paris at the moment. Can I get you to tell us why Paris is so special? Because Last night, Jérôme Sans and I had a little chat, and Jérôme was saying, this is the most important moment in the history of the Paris art scene since the Second World War. I mean, do you agree with that? Yeah, totally, I think. I think we... We can't hear you I'm either. I'm sorry, yeah. No, no, even, even though you don't have earrings, I think we need <laughs> to hear you more. Is, is, it, is it better like this, or...? Louder. 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 Speak louder. Speak louder. I will try. Okay. 
Um, so, um, no, I think um, Paris is really uh, undergoing um, a moment of artistic uh, effervescence we haven't we haven't seen for for a very long time. And uh, because my career started at FIAC in 2000, so I know exactly. Uh, I've been at FIAC and Paris Photo, and I know uh, how how w hard it was to attract foreign galleries in Paris. Uh, people were talking about London, uh, first Berlin at the end of the 90s, and then London at the beginning of uh, Freeze was uh, created and launched in 2003, yeah? and, uh, and I was at FIAC at that moment, and uh, we had a sense of defeat, you know. Uh, the team of FIAC was at Freeze, and we could see that the energy was in London, not in Paris, so what's going on now, it's, it's quite incredible. It's maybe the only good news in the world today, I think. Uh, can, can you tell us some of the uh, uh, objections that were being raised when you said, uh, what about Paris, what would they say to you? They would say, what, what's, what was missing in Paris before? I think, I would, I would say maybe uh, uh, shortly that uh, it was a very sleeping beauty, Paris. Pe people would say uh, it's a beautiful city, it's a prestigious uh, place to do things uh, for, for established artists. Uh, it was not seen as a place for experimentation in, in terms of contemporary art. It was, people were leaving. Uh, I knew a lot of people in the 90s and, and beginning of uh, 2000s, they were leaving to London, they were going to New York. Uh, in search of something more exciting, uh, because Paris was, uh, we had this impression that nothing was moving and it was a uh, kind of stillness, you know. The, as you know, uh, there was the, uh, we had a very socialist uh, state, you know, and uh, in starting in 81, you know, and uh, so everything was handled by the states uh, and it was, little place for private initiatives and um, you know it was difficult in the early uh, 2000s and I think uh, we looked at London a lot, we looked at Berlin as well and, uh, and uh, it was interesting to see that um, before the Brexit some people wanted to do something good for Paris and uh, I think the most interesting things was the, the rise of uh, private initiatives I, I will think about, um, I would I should mention Antoine Galbert with the Maison Rouge, with the with Cartier before. Uh, the Cartier Foundation, which Cartier was, Foundation. I mean, it, it was, was set it up was a long time ago. Yeah, 1996. Huh? Yeah. And Cartier, as you know, is going to have a new headquarter near the nearby the Louvre, in front of the opposite the Louvre, in the Louvre des Antiquaires. They're going to have a new venue. Uh, they think that it's going to be uh, open in 2025 and. Uh, is going to be a new striking venue of uh, 17,000 meters square, so and designed by Jean Nouvel. So this is going to be a, a next step that is going to be important for Paris. But I should go back to Antoine Galbert. I think he, he's really open. He opened the way. He was, uh, it was a very interesting uh, first really private foundations uh, led by an individual, not a company company. And uh, and then we had uh, Vuitton, because Vuitton was, uh, they decided to build the Fondation Vuitton in 2006. Uh, the decision was made in 2006, so you know, it's interesting to know that. And uh, then we had the collection Pinot. Uh, Pinot wanted to do first uh, a project, as you know, at Il Seguin in, yes, in 2000. Yes, I'm aware. Then he went to Venice and opened he went to, to Venice, Venice then. Because and now he's got uh, the Bourse de Commerce in yeah. Paris. Yeah. And the Bourse de Commerce was decided in maybe in 2014, something It's like true, that. you know, in other words, a lot of these decisions were made not yesterday or the day yeah. before, I but think many that years because ago. There is a kind of uh, saying now that, you know, thanks to the Brexit, Paris is, has become the, 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 really the, the new center for contemporary art. But I think uh, all this was uh, engineering, uh, um, you know, uh, it all started for me in, in two around 2000, uh, 2010, you know, Gagosian. Gagosian opened his galleries in 2010. Then uh, we could see, uh, then it's, I think things accelerated, you know, in 2017 when Macron gets uh, in power, I think, because it was uh, a more liberal uh, thinking as well. And, uh, and I could feel that the energy was, was starting to be uh, interesting and we had uh, a lot of uh, 
especially a lot of private initiatives, I think, developing. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, if I may just jump in, um, the, the fact is that Paris was, as you say, uh, a sleeping beauty, and uh, now it's a beauty, but it's no longer sleep sleeping, it's, it's, it's awake, it's wide awake. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the Paris was, of course, as we all know, this extraordinary mecca of, of, of a traditional art, old master art uh, museums. And, uh, and then, as you say, uh, these private foundations jumped in, you know, uh, Louis Vuitton, uh, Arnaud, you know, he decided to create, ask Frank Gehry to create this extraordinary glass vessel on the edges of Paris. And, uh, and, and put, you know, a lot of uh, sort of extraordinary exhibitions on there by the, the Chukin collection, the Morozov collection, just some spectacular uh, exhibitions. Then we had Pinot, who, um, after opening two places in Venice, has opened the Bourse de Commerce in the heart of Paris. And now, of course, as you were saying, the Fondation Cartier, which has had a, a sort of, um, you know, it's already had a... Uh, a, a major, major building by Jean Nouvel in uh, Montparnasse area is opening across from the Louvre. So as you say, there's a lot of private money, which in France was a long, for a long time kind of almost taboo. Mm -hmm. We don't like to talk about private money. Money is not, you know, it's not we don't like money and art cannot be muddled with money. Uh, now there is this kind of, first of all, there was a thirst for contemporary art and there wasn't enough of it in Paris, contemporary art. That existed at Palais de Tokyo, but it, you know, elsewhere people were thirsty for it and they weren't getting it. So I think the private money also filled that gap. Um, I think Alain Kermain will describe this whole process better than me. Uh, but I, I'd like Alain, um, uh, please, if you could jump in and pick up on something that uh, that Guillaume said, which is to say, Brexit is not the reason why we are seeing this resurgence of Paris. This is a much more, you know kind of uh, yes, I, uh, just deep to rooted all, I totally agree. And so also one point I would like to underscore, we are not here well, to promote Paris. Well, this is talking galleries, so we have to be somewhat analytical and try to understand how it all well occurred. And I think there were several steps, and I totally agree with what Guillaume said before. It was a rather continuous process. And I think, well, Brexit made foreigners more conscious of that. But, well, I totally agree that what probably lacked Paris for very many years, what this well, interaction between all the private sector and the public sector. And one thing to me that seems also super important was 2012, when Tadeusz Hopak decided to totally overhaul so the social representations we had of the city and decided to open this mega space in Pantin. Because while well, for very many years, for Parisians, it was nearly impossible to believe that we would go beyond the peripheric, so you know all this well, kind of motorway that encircles Paris. And Tadeusz Hopak found a new space, so three big buildings, former factories, and he created the first mega gallery in France, and probably in a big city, the first mega gallery that big in Europe. And it was such a radical change that Gagosian, who was at the time the unrivaled leader, just a few days after well, Tadus Hopak opened this space, which at the time really was very daring, it was a total bet. Very many people did not believe it could work. He had to open also another space gigantic one also in Le Bourget. But it was totally unexpected because while well, normally Gagosian, who was the leader, should have been well, you know, the one who'd had well, the ID first. And it also was very surprising because while well, Tadus Hopak opened with an Anthem Kiefer show and just well, a few days later, Gagosian also opened with an Anthem Kiefer show. Absolutely, so he yeah. definitely was a follower. But while well, in the symbolic order of art galleries at the time, you had this European guy so very Austrian, but very European too, who took the initiative and this well, American tycoon was forced to follow. And then I totally agree, two years later, so Fondation Louis Vuitton opened with this huge daring building. You know, in Paris, we are very, I don't know much well, attached to heritage. And when it comes to contemporary buildings, we are always a bit reluctant. And it was a very radical sign creating this building and they organized incredible exhibitions, and now the concentration in Paris totally changed. We have all these, well, either public or private institutions, and if you start, so with 
Centre Georges Pompidou, then just a few hundred meters away from Centre Georges Pompidou, you have Bourse de Commerce, then a few hundred meters away, you will have Wall Fondation Cartier pour l'art contemporain. When it moves to the very center of Paris, then you have Musée du Louvre, then you just will cross the Seine River, and you arrive so at Musée d'Orsay, and just a few meters away, or hundred meters away, you have Musée des Arts Premiers, then Somewhat yeah, further. Yeah. I mean, the geography know, changed it's, radically. It's, 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 a, it's an incredible cornucopia of, uh, yes. of offerings. But you, the question I want to ask you before we go back to, to our other speakers, and by the way, does someone have a radio on or something? With, I'm hearing some. It's the receivers. Maybe the translation. Oh, translation. Yeah. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to get you know, a sense from you how come private money became less taboo? Because the whole business. I mean, I grew up for many years. I mean, I grew up in France partly. And uh, I personally, I was reluctant to go into a private foundation that showed art because I thought art is in the museums and this private foundation, what is, you know, their relationship, you know, and money and art and everything. It was all very separate. There were like Chinese walls, as we say. How come these Chinese walls came tumbling down in France? I think it also, well, made by, so when you see what private money can make, it really is, well, very impressive, you know? When you go to Fondation Louis Vuitton, you see the exhibitions, they are incredibly well done, you see? And they hired Suzanne Paget, she was well, the former director of Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris. She was very esteemed, and while well, she had to retire, because while well, she was too old to work in the public sector, and in France, we have these so, laws which are super strict. And then she was hired by the private sector, and she could all well, help with her expertise. She's an incredible curator, and what they organize as exhibitions are incredible ones. You mentioned so um, um, the Mordzov exhibition, the Chukin exhibition, even before this. At the moment, they are showing Joel Mitchell and Claude Monet, and yeah. they have so if much money. They can do things the if public I might sector add, could not make. The Chukin and Morozov collections were um, curated by the great Anne Baldessari. Oh, so, yes. Yes. Just Sorry to get well. her name. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Um, Who is carry, a on. Curator. No, no, carry on. I think yeah. it's, it's, Guillaume, go ahead. I would like to, to talk about this uh, change of generation. Yeah. It's important because... As you know, French cultural landscape uh, was always shaped by the public money. Uh, it's, it dates back from the Louis XIV, you know. Art was used as a tool for uh, projection of power, and uh, so the state has always been with the academy, you know, if we're going back in, into the French history. There was always the, the place of the state which was very important, and uh, this very uh, distrust or suspicious attitude toward private money, so there's a lot of, lot of French intellectuals. They think that private is like dirty money, you know, that the, the, that art is a public thing that should be only handled by the state because there will be no private interest uh, mingle. Or, and I think there's, there's, there's a big change in France. There's a big change in terms of c collectors. And but but how do you explain that, you know, from going to going from money is dirty to <laughs> now, you know? But because is, you have this new generation of uh, French, I say, that, that are really international. They speak English these days, you know. I mean, uh, when I started FIAC in 2000, the collectors were very French-centric, you know. And, and now you have this very successful entrepreneur from the 30s years old, 40 years old. They have money and they want, they want something else. And they also... They're much more international. They, they went to see the Tate in London. I think everybody has imp been impressed by the, the way London also uh, become the prominent place in, in the early 2000s. In the 90s, London had only 25 galleries, you know, and uh, suddenly London became the place to be. I noticed that, actually, <laughs> going from London to Paris so often. I will give, it, give you the, um, the, the, the platform right away, just to say... Um, I would go to London, okay, Tate Modern would be doing this, and then the Serpentine would be doing that, and then, and then I'd go to Paris, and then maybe two, three years later, like La Monnaie de Paris, I would see suddenly a big Grace and Perry show at the Monnaie de Paris. I would see a lot of artists who we had seen in London two, three years earlier. I mean, even British artists like Tracy Emin or whatever, or Damien Hirst, becoming massive phenomena. I mean, we had a massive Damien Hirst show at the Fondation Cartier, mm -hmm. which is quite a prominent, prestigious mm -hmm. place to have a show. Mm -hmm. He had all his little recent dots, his sort of like pointillism phase. 
and they were all there. Anyway, Juzi, uh, tell us about this business of how Paris has grown to like money more and consider it less dirty. You know, <laughs> you know. How That's are you? You know, how are you dealing with that? <laughs> okay. And who are your collectors? Yeah, no, I just want to add something what we say before because, like. Uh, private institution. So we, we, we was spoke about public institution. Um, you're, a, you're a gallery, you're not yeah, an institution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pu public uh, and private private enterprise, if you want. No, I, I speak uh, like an institution because people know how it's like space. So um, like private actor, um, we understand, uh, I think also all colleagues or other gallery understand that you can't do things without the public support. So I speak about really uh, public money. So you are saying that your gallery is working with a no, I, I think that we are inside something more bigger. An that, ecosystem that yeah, is also that public and private. World. And I want to show here, for example, some example. And you can see uh, how is important in the crisis moment. I think pandemic moment need to be understand was really something that changed the things because in the pandemic and also in crisis in general, the public uh, institution and uh, political money uh, for the pandemic was there. For example, uh, we was in like, a COVID moment, everything was closed, and FRAC, FRAC, the Fonds Régional d'Art Contemporain, start to uh, buy things, so... So this is a regional fund for contemporary art that the French state has set up and that goes out and buys art with taxpayer money. Yes, and, and maybe f for us does make the difference, but for the little gallery was very important. And I say that in this way, because we are also worker, so... Uh, what the French state make for us was very important. And when you are a private enterprise or institution or what you want, um, you need to think of this. You yeah, they helped you pay the salaries during the uh, pandemic. Yeah, yeah, and when you choose a place, you need to think of all this. Okay. okay? Yeah. And um, and other things, um, yeah. Paris, it's not the big market so that you you can think. So London, I, it's it's quite huge. But Paris start to be interesting, n not for its market, but f for what she start to um, do and she want to build. Yeah. Maybe I can get Guillaume to build on that. Yeah. I mean, what are some of the I advantages? Just, I, just, I just want to add that, you know, uh, this is maybe one of the key of this resurgence of Renaissance of Paris, is that you have private initiatives and competing with also public institutions. And that's, that's, that's the, uh, the Renaissance, in a way, because there's, there's also this very interesting moment where you have the Pompidou, and, you know, it's, it's interesting, because the, the way... The, the Vuitton and, and, and Pinot are making the exhibitions. Uh, it has also, it makes the, uh, you know, uh, it, it triggered a, a also a, a reaction from the public institutions. So it's a very interesting situation. Yeah, but I'm interested also in hearing from you as a fair director, because you had a fair. Yeah, and I've got a fair. Yeah, and got I can a fair see. And I <laughs> can see. I can see the rise of Paris because uh, uh, my selection committee was yesterday, and I received a record-breaking number of applications. So something that we we never experienced before. So because there is this desire of Paris, and a lot of foreign galleries wants to be in Paris now. They want to open galleries, and I think what also I think it's interesting because we we're talking about the big galleries. But uh, what I like about what's going on right now is you have 
the big the, the blue chip galleries, but rubbing shoulders with the, these mid-size uh, structures, you know, uh, mid-size galleries that are opening a lot of uh, also s new spaces in Paris. So, so can you give us a bit, uh, some numbers, like how many people applied and how many did you accept, or you can't tell I us? Don't, no, no, because we have two selection committee, but uh, factually uh, we received 250 applications. And we we've said no to 150 galleries. That's a lot. That's and a lot. And we have a next committee. I'm glad I'm not one of them. <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah, <laughs> it's a uh, but it's a good sign for 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 Paris because, as you know, in terms of fair, we're going to have a, a Paris Plus by Art Basel. You know, uh, starting in two weeks. Uh, so it, it, I think it's been also very important the arrival of Art Basel in Paris because he put the finger on, on Paris as a place to be, and w which was not the case before because, as you know, I've been traveling in many countries and for a lot of scenes, if you talk about Eastern Europe, uh, the destination was not Paris, it was London or New York or Berlin and uh, there was a lot of scenes that, that didn't consider Paris as the place to be, you know. But I think with the arrival of uh, Art Basel, it has a kind of leverage effect, you know, and uh, yeah. and and p I know that there will be a lot of a group of collectors from uh, the U.S. museum coming, attending uh, Paris Plus, and maybe uh, before they will go directly to London, and now they're going directly to Paris. So it's yeah. very interesting mm -hmm. to know that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, so, uh, Alain, I know that uh, Brexit is not the reason for all of these things happening. Paris has been active and bubbling and doing extraordinary things long before there was this horrible, sorry, <laughs> vote in London in the UK 2016 yeah. to exit the e European Union. Um, but, and of course yesterday we did have Julia Peyton-Jones reminding us that the art market in London represents something like nine billion pounds, I think she said, or nine, euros. Nine point billion dollars. Nine point in two thousand in twenty twenty, you know, uh, I, I've got the figures. So yeah. it's according to Art Basel reports, you know. Yeah. So the UK art market is estimated at at nine. Estimated, point, yes. Yeah, at nine point nine billion dollars. Meanwhile, the French market in twenty twenty is estimated at three point one billion dollars. Okay. So fine. So anyway. We have no uh, really dispute around the fact that London is a huge marketplace. I live there and I'm constantly in Paris. I mean, Paris being the new London, that's kind of a silly question. Paris is not going to be the new London. Paris is going to be a very complimentary and gorgeous city across the channel um, via Eurostar <laughs> from London. And these two cities um, should cohabit and, uh, and create a perfect world. I, f I think it's a perfect world living between the two cities, as I do. But anyway, um, Alain, I do think, however, that Brexit has played a role. I we do cannot, agree. Un indisputably, there has been a role played by Brexit. I do and agree. And I'd, like, I'd like you to tell us exactly what that role Well, was. some galleries that did not open space until this time in Paris, and the best example was David Zwerner. David Zwerner well, made it explicit that he decided to open a space in Paris because of, because of Brexit. And also, Marianne Goodman, shortly after Brexit, she decided to close a uh, London space, but well, she kept the Paris one. So this really makes a big difference. So it accelerated the tendency, it made Paris more desirable, and I think this is also why. So MCH Group, that possesses Art Basel, also really wanted to get so this whole art fair in Paris, because while well, Paris is booming, but while well, as we try to make it clear, it really was started much earlier. And I think while well, there are still are some perspectives for London, but the problem is that while well, now, if London really wants to react, because well, so there has always been some kind of competition between Paris and London, which was <laughs> partly so illustrated by the rivalry between well, so Fiac and Freeze being well nearly well at the same moment during the same month. And I think well an option could be for London now, as there are no more part of the European market, just to choose one way, which is a quite radical one, but which could be a solution which would be dumping. So you know now they are at the entry of the European market, but outside of it. So if they adopt new taxes which would be super aggressive, super low, they can maintain the positions 
or even develop them. But I'm quite sure they couldn't do it immediately because while in Brexit was marketed to the British people, it was sold as something make Britain great again. And of course, this would be a solution that is more the solution that is normally adopted by, well, poor countries. But yeah. well, it would be a bit, well, you know, so mm, tricky. It would be a bit cynical, but I think it can be a solution for the British market. Well, if you looked at the currency markets the other day, what happened to the pound? I mean, yes. it, was, uh, it was looking very much like an emerging market, the United Kingdom, wasn't it? Um, so, yeah, I'd like to open it up now. Uh, we are going to come back. I'm going to come back to uh, my wonderful three speakers. However, we have a question from Paco Bauragan in the back of the room. Paco, please. You can borrow mine. Um, I just wanted to tap in. Can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, oh yes, yes. Okay. But I think you're already bored of me. You've seen me all these days. Uh, Paco Arran, <laughs> curator, and... Oh, oh. <laughs> he got mad at what I said. <laughs> okay, so I'm a curator and a writer, and I have a wonderful book about the history of art fairs and biennials that you should buy. And uh, I just wanted to tap in to the conversation, uh, because I think that um, what you said about money being naughty, French collectors not wanting to go public, that's a very uh, European idea. It was in Spain for many years, and it was in, um, I think, um, the I Netherlands. I think it might, might be a Catholic, kind of slightly Catholic <laughs> attitude. Yeah. yeah, it's a yeah. Catholic. It's not a Calvinist attitude. It's not Dutch or whatever. But I think that um, the change to me, which I, I've been doing lots of art fairs and traveling a lot these years, so the change was the Miami model. I think that totally changed the script and changed the rules. What do I mean with the Miami model? Of course. Art Basel, Miami, yeah, but the, the collectors. I mean, uh, De La Cruz. Uh, all these collectors have started to open their houses and uh, show that you can be trendy, flashy. And at that point, I, I saw that, uh, especially Spanish friends and other collectors, were slowly getting used to the idea of exhibiting their own collections. Yeah, can I ask you to, to ask a question, if you have one? No, no, I w just wanted to tap in because when you said that there was a change, I, 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 from my perspective, in Europe there is a general change because the U.S. market and U.S. collectors and their habits has been infecting or influencing them. Okay, and yeah. No, I, I don't agree with you at all. Okay, that's fine. I Let's mean, go, you thank you. You come back to the French situation. Uh, have you heard about this uh, it's Suzanne Paget, you know, it was interesting, very interesting exhibition, Passion Privé, Private Patients, in 1999, the Musée de la Moderne. So it was the first time that some collectors will show publicly their collections. You know what happened? The tax people, from the French tax people, came to see the exhibitions, and then they, they went to do, uh, they did inquiries about these people, where the money was coming from. So you know, I don't think when you're talking about Miami, I went many times, it's entertainment, as you know. But, um, you know, I don't think that you find this type of French collectors opening the house and uh, to all the people. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, when you go, uh, I've been working like uh, 20 years for FIAC, Paris Photo, uh, between our Paris. We never had a French collectors opening his house for a private VIP visit. So it's yeah, interesting to know interesting. that. That's the French situation yeah, in other words, context. T tax so I don't want you to bring the Miami context to Paris because it's not at all the situation. Okay. We have another question here. Ilaria, did you have one? Yeah. I'm Can you take the microphone and introduce yourself? Again? Hello. Sorry. I'm uh, Ilaria Bonacossa. Yeah. I'm a curator and I ran Artissima Fair for five years and now I'm working for the government to open the new National Museum of Digital Art in uh, Milano. And I think, uh, for example, this idea of Paris, the new London, and these new 
uh, balances in Europe, I'm thinking of other cities in the action. Because, for example, Milano is a very uh, strange case of a sudden economic boom, not yet so much in uh, the art market, even if uh, most Italian galleries have opened a space in Milano. So even the galleries who are in Naples, in Rome, they have a small space in Milano as the place to be. And so is it really like, I mean, I, I see the hype on Paris, we're all seeing it, mm -hmm. but is it, I mean, isn't Paris the new Paris and maybe Milano is the new London? <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> now we're starting. No, <laughs> no but I let's let's have let's have no. Juzi come okay. in here. Juzi, uh, what what are your thoughts about you know a, a great Italian city also being the new mecca of art? Mm. Something happened in Paris. I I'm, I'm in Paris since fourteen years, and it's I don't know. It's a strong energy that arrived, and I think it's um, and. It was interesting to to hear about digital world, no? Because it we need in the real world to start to build something else to to make a new reflection of the real world world. So maybe yes, uh, there is not the primate, so there is not one city that will be the place to be, and the other city will start to build something to build something what's a community i think uh, that we chose paris because we want to understand paris like a territory territory in the french way territoire a place where there is social political economical things very interesting and i think maybe in milano too it will be the case but in paris uh, hope was Paris was very old in his way to think. And now it's like if 15 years was passing this way and you can feel a fresh energy. Can, I, can, I, can yeah. I just yeah. Yeah. No, one I, thing? I, I, just I, very I'd fast. like, I'd like you. I, I, yeah, I, like I would you. like just about to like speak about the fact that when you are coming to Paris, so, uh, maybe some people coming back because they... They, they wanted to escape from Paris and now they're they are returning. And I, when we're talking about ecosystem also, uh, we talk about the greater Paris, there's a lot of development. As you know, we're going to have the Olympic Games in 2024, so it's also triggering a, a lot of new projects. Uh, we just had this new space, La Félicité, you know, it's built by Enrich, open in Paris, so it's going, it's going to be a kind of mixed uh, space, but it's also a very interesting place to go and uh, there will be uh, a lot of new things uh, that are going to be open for the Olympic Games in 2024. Even okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. important <laughs> to say that and we have this also no, no, behind. I, I, yeah. I think we need to go back to yeah. you. What Did you want to say something else? No, I just wanted to, when you said that you were going to London and Paris was bringing back things you had already seen, but as a curator, I remember the opening of Palais de Tokyo as the one thing in Europe that swept us all yeah. off our feet, and it was the center of well, contemporary. Well, we have the two founders No, but here I mean, I'm just saying it's so that <laughs> it's not true that Paris always felt it was following. When that happened, Paris was more contemporary than London. No, I totally agree with you. We did say, I mean, Alain did point out that London was very much a desert, and even Julia yesterday was saying that it was very much a desert before the YBAs came along. Mm -hmm. uh, where I'm not saying anything different. I'm just saying in the last, five, uh, say, 10 years, there's been a lot of people looking at London, including New York, by the way. Mm -hmm. New York is looking a lot at what L Tate does at Serpentine. Anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, if the gentlemen who are the founders of Paris Tokyo want to comment on, uh, you know, the resurgence of Paris, you're most welcome. But let's have a, a question from here. Introduce yourself. Um, hello, Anja Bradovic Borelis, um, founder of Hestia um, Gallery and Residency in Belgrade. Um, I also want to open up space in, Bel in Paris. There we go. But just because I happen to move there. Okay. If you could, <laughs> if you could ask us a question, please. Yes. Our um, so there is um, also other smaller fairs which are based on other geographies, as you were commenting on other geographies as well. The Mena Art Fair. There is one about Asia. The 154 is also in Paris. Um, 154 and is London, and then and then also Paris. Yeah, yeah, Marrakesh, but it, it's also anyway. In Paris. Can I get your question? Yes, the please. question is: So London had, for example, the Calvert 22 Foundation as an institution showcasing um, Eastern European art, for example. Uh, in Paris, we have the Institut du Monde Arabe, Maison d'Amérique Latine. 
Um, how nothing, much do you nothing think about Eastern Europe proper? Is that what you're saying? No, I just want to ask uh, how much would do you think Paris would be open to include even more geographies? For example, I'm working with a curator from Estonia and she's thinking about oh, doing okay. a Baltic I, Contemporary Art Center. So let's go. Guillaume. Yeah. yeah, because I've just been to Estonia last May, so you know, I know quite well the situation now about Estonian art. And uh, it's very interesting because we have a lot of uh, residency, new residency program, you know, in Paris, like such as PUSH in Aubervilliers. So there's a, I don't know if you've been to Fimenko, you know, this is in Romainville, but this uh, space, you know, uh, welcomes a lot of uh, artists and curators from Eastern Europe. Uh, even from Bulgaria, Estonia. So it's uh, very interesting to see um, these spaces because uh, it brings this, uh, this uh, diversity in Paris and that's why it's, it's becoming a, a very multicultural city, you know? It's it, I mean, it, it always has been and I can actually yeah. speak from first-hand experience. Uh, I've written a book and I left some leaflets on the table. Someone took them away, but um, I can give you leaflets about this book only because I have section on France in there and I talk about how France is outside from seen from the outside world described as xenophobic and and racist and of course there are these problems but as someone who is from Iran and who moved there uh, many moons ago I have to say that um, the French embraced and continue to embrace people from all cultures uh, very openly. There is an extraordinary cultural curiosity in France that I don't find, and I, by the way, I, I really have, I've lived in Italy and I've lived all over. I do not find the same cultural curiosity in other places. So I have to sing the praises of, of France and its openness. So, you know, it would absolutely be open to Estonia. Alain, yes, can, you, can, can you confirm? If I can also add well something, when it also comes to art fairs, so of course, Art Basel and all its well, other well, art fairs that are organized by MCH Group, they are supposed to be very global, but well, most of the time you will always find American galleries, so British galleries, German galleries, Swiss galleries, Italian galleries, and that would be most of the galleries participating. If you have some space for a second world art fair like Art Paris, for instance, in, so, um, in France, you can have more inclusivity, I think, in terms of well, geographic so origin of the galleries while well, participating. Do you agree, so Guillaume? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, for, for, for example, you know, uh, because I'm traveling a lot, uh, I brought to Art Paris two years ago a gallery from Guatemala. It is making, it's, nobody knew about contemporary art in Guatemala, in France. It's been a, an instant success for, and I'm very glad because it's a lot of uh, money, as you know, to come to Paris. And Paris is a very expensive city, especially the Grand Palais. So that, that's a problem for us. But uh, we can see all these geographies, you know, and uh, it's interesting. Yes, and if and the market it's, it's grows, a second art It's getting fair. stronger. Yeah. I, I, I don't mean that Paris was not multicultural enough, but I think it's getting stronger. That's what yeah. I want to yeah. add. No, I mean, Guillaume speaks a yeah. few words of my language. Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> Salam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's hear from Sabrina. And if you could introduce yourself fully, Sabrina, please. Good morning. Thank <laughs> you so much. I'm Sabrina Amrani, gallerist and, uh, and uh, partner in crime of Materia. Um, but it's a very wonderful conversation. I'm a Parisian who left, in fact, Paris <laughs> quite some years ago and based in Madrid. Um, we are talking about amazing developments of private uh, enterprises, private uh, money, institution. It looks very great. But what is, um, does it affect the contemporary or emerging creation? And can you see already the effect of, uh, the effect of this the spread, amazing you know. developments mm -hmm. on the most emerging uh, strata of the art world? Yes, sure. Um, other possibilities are coming, and uh, factually, for example, there is a beautiful residence experience, uh, Art Explora, that coming, and this can really who bring... Create, who created that? Frédéric uh, Jousset. Frédéric Jousset. Frédéric Jousset. 
Mm, so it's a private uh, structure, and um, I. But it's a it's a possibility for private and public institution and enterprise, and so they bring artists uh, in these cities. The um, the possibility to have artists in the city, the artists of international geography. It's important. So in this moment, we have Nikhil Chopra, that is an artist from India, that never uh, in the past we can imagine to have, because it's uh, a good artist and he lives with his wife, etc. But now he's in Paris with his wife and really uh, live in Paris. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, I would like to, Sabrina, because uh, what strikes me when I visited Push, you know, mm -hmm. or, or the yes. residency, uh, is to see that there was a uh, French artist for once were engaged, fronted with other artists from foreign countries, because it was maybe the problem with French artists, they were not enough uh, going out uh, abroad. And I think it's, uh, when I see now this dialogue between the conversation, the level of conversation, is getting really interesting. And I feel that there's a lot of a new generation of French artists that I think uh, are really more engaged in the in the larger world, you know? Yeah, in Sabrina, terms of did, you, did you have a follow-up or? Mm. Yes. Uh, yes. You hear me? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, thank you. Nikhil Chopra is uh, indeed not an emerging artist, but yeah, 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 sure, a very sure. established artist of the, of the South Asia scene. Um, but uh, I mean, most directly, is it still possible for a young artist to live and create in Paris? And what happens if Parisian young artists are not able to be in contact with their own city and nurture themselves from their own city? I mean, uh, yeah. for me, but it's important that. Paris start to uh, meet the world, okay? So they find the space where people can meet. It's for this that I say that Nikki Chopra coming and can in Art Explorer or in another space uh, met other people. Like big gallery continua invites um, uh, students of fine arts. We, we know what's happening in fine arts, so we, we really enjoy uh, and uh, we, we are not in a kind of separation of what young artists did it. And we need to be attentive of w mm -hmm. what happened and we open a space um, in the gallery where we, we make only project for young artists and maybe it's a pop-up. <laughs> so we, we, we host Paloma Boutier with a performance uh, and she's 20 years old and yeah. uh, she, mm -hmm. she was near Anish Kapoor and uh, she, she met other artists of her gallery yeah. in this way. Sorry, no, I mean, I do want to play devil's advocate here because having lived in both cities for a very long time, I can say that it's very, very difficult to do business in France. It remains difficult in spite of many years of Macron and other efforts that have been made. Uh, there is a lot of uh, paperwork, extraordinary amounts of paperwork. If you want to set up a company in Paris, it's simpler than it used to be. But as far as I understand, from the day one, you have to start paying huge kind of taxes and payroll taxes even before you've earned a single cent. Whereas I have friends in London who set up companies in one morning. They set it up, they get the company f the document, they go to the bank, they open the account, they're in business and they don't pay tax until the first year. Mm. And if they didn't make enough money, then they don't pay tax. So this is the big problem that France has, continues to have. And I would like, yes, it's, it's, totally, wrong, yeah. it's totally right because I'm, I, I'm living in both cities. I can yes. you 20 years old, you can open immediately your account. Here, you're, you're okay. No, I'm, I'm loud enough. You're not. <laughs> this okay. is wrong. Um, excuse me. No, you, it's you not wrong no, no, no. because I, I have I first-hand experience. I have many people around me who are opening their business in Paris right now. You can okay. make it within a week and you don't pay any tax for the first year. Okay, you great. pay the second, of course. Like everyone, great. you pay the second. Yeah. It's very the, fast. Well, that's One great. Week yeah, to but open Alain, your Alain, can you, can you give it. us your, you know, because All you are an academic. Are it. Everyone around herself are, is doing that right now. It's so fast. It was long before. It was yeah. an impossible road. I did it okay. years no, ago. they have improved yeah. it. No. It Just was let's have Alain Kemin come in. Can we have Alain, who's, a, who's an academic and a professor, 
and who kind of looks at these issues. Can you tell us about the ease of business in Paris nowadays? Well, it's easier, yes, of course. And now people are more accustomed so to integrating money in the art world. I think, well, before, it really was some kind of, well, cultural reluctance to, well, develop business around art. And now I think, well, it's so much accepted that it makes things even, well, much easier. But I think, well, Josie will also agree. No, no, but I mean, I'm interested in what Jérôme was saying about auto-entrepreneurs. Yes, yes. Very many young people, they will adopt the status because, well, it's very flexible. But is it for only for young people? Or no, is it for, no, okay. but while well, young people... Even old people can, you know, do the same? There is no age discrimination. Okay. Everyone can adopt the status. And sometimes the status is a bit too developed. So sometimes even some firms, they push their so employees so to adopt the status, which is super, you know, well, flexible, not very protective, but well, this really helps so people who have well, some projects to develop well, some firms, entrepreneurship, so to develop their business. Yeah, the bureaucracy, as Guillaume was pointing out, there is also this bureaucracy. But Juzi, maybe, can you talk about the bureaucracy of opening so up? I, I, I was an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, I was. Um, it's true. No, I, I want to say just one sentence. Yes. You can feel support. So uh, you, you need to make some paper, but you can feel support. Okay, great. Do we have another, uh, more yeah. questions? It's a hot session. I knew it would be. <laughs> <laughs> Please introduce yourself if you could. Uh, oh. Hi, Amira Soloch. I'm uh, an urban planner, focus on culture and heritage uh, between Beirut, Barcelona, Athens, and Paris. Um, Mike, thank you very much for a great discussion. I'm curious at the city level, what the mayor is doing to help Paris with this new infrastructure. Um, so while it's interesting to hear from a business level on the tax um, and setting up a business, but I'm curious on the city level for these fairs, for these galleries, for, um, you know, how is that improving? Well, I mean, I will let one of these, one of my speakers answer, but uh, you know, uh, the mayor of Paris actually gave a 50-year lease yes. to the Fondation Vuitton, uh, al allowing them to open the Fondation, because that piece of land mm -hmm. belongs to the city of Paris. And, also and she did the Pinot. same yes. with Pinot and mm -hmm. the Bourse de Commerce. So the, at least at that level, there's been help from the mayor of Paris. I don't know whether... And I qui also quite the same for Pantin. When Sotadov's Hopak decided to open this huge mega space in Pantin, the mayor told the owner of these well, former factories he wanted so these former spaces that were so abandoned to be turned into this mega gallery. And he was super helpful to make Pantin so a city which really promotes culture and the arts. So you see, well, the cities are very conscious of the of what is at stake today with world well, culture and the arts, and both in Paris, but well, also in the suburbs. So these well, cities just really try to promote culture and the arts because all of its well, economic impact. Yeah, uh, uh, they've learned a lesson from the failure of the Il Saga with mm -hmm. Pino. Yes. It was a big blow for Paris, you know, to Can know you that. describe the story of Il Saga? So, or maybe Il I Sagan, can. Il Saga, yes, I, very I important. Can uh, I can Pino, try and... Um, yeah, because Pino was uh, planning to do a huge museum uh, designed by Tadeando for the Il Saga uh, for Paris. Il Saga uh, is sort of right really on the edges oh. of Paris. It's uh, just uh, off boulogne Billancourt. It's like... Yeah. On, the west, on the west, west side, west. Yeah. Southwest Paris. And, uh, you know... It's an island. It's an island, but it was the former uh, factory for Frenot, so, you know, <coughs> and uh, so there was... Former a car factory, Renault. Car factory, so it's a very important uh, place of memory, and... Um, and also the city of uh, boulogne billancourt was not aware of the importance of the project so because they didn't do anything to save the project. And there was a lot of associations that battle against Pinot. And Pinot was so fed up that, you know, he decided to uh, go, go to, to Venice. Venice. So bye-bye Paris. And it was a big blow for the city. So when Vuitton started, the city of Paris, everybody, you know, agreed that uh, w they were not going to let the same situation happen. And it was a true mobilization to impeach the uh, associations to, uh, well, to destroy the project. And uh, it happened also with uh, the Grand Palais Ephemer. As you know, uh, the Olympic Games is 2024. So, so just to explain, Grand Palais is now closed for refurbishment. And there's a temporary one which yeah. has been parked outside the Eiffel Tower. Which, which okay. costs a fortune. Which is like called Grand Palais Ephemer. On the Champ de Mars, the yeah. Champ de Mars belongs to the city of Paris, and yes. the Grand Palais is run by the states and the Réunion des Musées Nationaux. And uh, and this building is is a luxury. It's, it has cost forty million euros. 
40 so, 40 yeah so it's not it's not a tent it's not t it's a temporary structures but it's luxuries and so this you know uh, also with the you know there was a problem with all the associations against this building on the champ de mars and uh, and there was a i should say a, really a common decision between the state and the city of Paris and the private actors, the, all the people doing the fairs at the Grand Palais, to find the solutions to make this building uh, built uh, instead of being at the Porte de Versailles, you exiled, you know, on, on the, and I, I think it was great for Paris, you know, it's great and uh, we're very lucky to have this. Certainly. Sorry. Yes, we have, a, no, yes. Go ahead. Sorry, I don't know. Hola. We have another question here. If that's all right with you. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Carlos Casals. I am an uh, owner of uh, an art gallery, a small art gallery founded in 1991. Um, I, I know that. Uh, Can we have a question, please? Uh, open an art gallery is, is a big illusion for uh, all the galleries. Uh, I remember uh, some years ago that uh, Paris has about 600 art galleries. I don't know how many. How is. many do we have now? Is that what you want to know? Uh, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, okay, if so. a lot of people want to buy, want to open an art gallery in, in, in Paris, uh, it's necessary to, to find a, a buyers. Uh, and then, you mean is uh, do, it easy do, do to find sellers? Oh, uh, well, uh, oh, collectors. No, 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 collectors. Yes, oh, okay. yes, well, yeah, yeah. So, uh, can I ask you what what the question is? <laughs> is Paris the going question to be is easy. <laughs> A lot of art galleries. Is how, are the, how are these to so find many art galleries collectors. going to find collectors? And yeah. then, and then, how, how many? Okay. How are these many art galleries going to find collectors? I, I want to say uh, something. No, uh, hold on, hold on. Uh, Let's have her they answer can first. Survive? Sorry. Do, do, do you think that that they can uh, survive? Yeah. Okay. We got. We got. We understand okay, your question. This is the question. We understand Thank the you. question. Okay. Can I say something? So, art gallery. It's not only a uh, relationship within uh, the galleries and the clients. It, more than that, and, and we know. So um, it's it's to reduce uh, the activity of the gallery. Yes, we are commercial commercial enterprise, but we need to think more bigger than then. Mm. So our story is special because we see a space. We go then and after we work and we did it. So we never think about how many clients can pass from 87 Rue du Temple. Well, you are a very major international yes, gallery, a very famous I one. Uh, let me move on to Alain with, yes, the, with uh, the same I question. Like hold on, hold on. This gentleman asked a very valid question. Mm -hmm. All these galleries are opening in Paris, right, left, and center. We hear from all of you and from the audience how many are opening. It's like a hornet's nest. How are these galleries all going to find collectors, all going to find clients? because they need to make money. Yes, well, but the thing is, you do not open a gallery and think, now I'm going to find clients. You have to have your clients in the city before you open the space. If you arrive, you're not selling shoes. You're not going to put a sign and say, I'm a real contemporary art gallery. People will just, well, not, well, get inside because, well, they see a sign. You have to socialize with them. You have to be part of the art world. I remember some years ago, a friend of mine, she suggested a friend of hers to come and meet me because, well, she was moving to, well, Singapore because, well, her husband was, well, moving to Singapore and she thought it would be nice to open an art gallery. And I said, come on, do you know any collectors in Singapore? She said, no. So I said, I was so surprised. She was so naive. She would believe she would arrive, put a sign, and clients would jump inside the gallery, which is not the way it works. So all these galleries that are opening now, they are opening this world the possibility to art fairs, especially so the art fairs taking part in Paris. Or they also met Parisian collectors. So in other world, European art fairs especially, and they know there is a potential for them, and this is why they are coming. But well, if you believe you can arrive and create a space 
it doesn't look like this. And I'm sure what Juicy will tell that while most collectors that they have and that they buy regularly in Paris, they already knew many of them. Of course, they found new collectors since they opened yeah. in Paris itself. Yeah. But while they uh, had the collectors. We need to be realistic. So French people love French things. Okay. Okay. So, well. <laughs> <laughs> like in any country. Like in any country. Okay. But uh, they are curious. And what start to be uh, very good for us that when we arrive in Paris and we start to work with French more French artists because we had, but we start to take more. All right. Then they uh, are more afraid and they start to think to us because uh, actually uh, you present us like Italian gallery. Yes, sure, we are an Italian gallery, but with the uh, Paris gallery, something open. We, we are really international now. So, and yeah, something changed. So we need to be realistic, but we need to dream also and uh, take the risk. I, I'm not sure that I agree. Uh, we, we, we need to be a little bit naive. Well, let's get Guillaume to arbitrate between these two. Well, what I don't okay. know. Okay, Guillaume. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to say that I can see a new generation of French, younger, like 30 years old. And they are totally uh, international. They love African art, and that's why you have this boom of African art in Paris. So no, no. When I arrived at Fiac, yes, it was in 2000. It was difficult. It was really French-centric. I, I remember this pattern of collectors. You know, they will start French-centric. You said French-centric. Yeah, they will start. You know, with modern art, and it will move thanks to the, uh, to the help of the galleries to more contemporary things, and maybe at the end they will help into international, you know? And now they go st direct to, they go direct to very, I can see, you know, p interest in Latin American art in Paris. That's why, you know, we have galleries from Latin America that are opening in Paris. Mm -hmm. I know t uh, two or three uh, galleries uh, specialized in Latin America. Also, we have a lot of galleries specializing to Korea. Uh, there's a strong link between Korea and, and and the French, I don't know why, but uh, this year, for example, I can see there's, a, I don't know if it's thanks to the free Seoul fair, but there's a, a boom of Korean galleries applying to the fair, so I think if they're coming to Paris, they, they, they find some, some buyer, French Yeah, cross-fertilization. So we have well. a last question. I think it will be the last question, yeah. yes? Yeah. I think we're, we have five more minutes, don't we? Five. five. Four. It Four will minutes. be a quick one. Yes, Marek. Uh, yeah, Can I'm you Marek. please? No, no, no. Introduce yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm Marek from uh, Artifacts. I'm from Berlin. So uh, in Berlin, uh, the galleries, or we are living from the outsiders. So over 90% of the sales for galleries are, is to external people from somewhere else. So it's a city that attracts. Is it the same in, uh, in Paris? So yeah. is it the tourist factor? So people like to come? No, no it's not only tourist. It's, uh, for, for my fair, I can talk about the... That's why, you know, I've got big galleries coming in my fair now, because they find this also French collectors from the region of France. They're very wealthy collectors, and they, maybe they will buy uh, 50,000, 60,000, uh, you know, n not like uh, a Chinese or American collectors in size, you know, and, and, but they are very interesting collectors. 50,000, 60,000 euro yeah, yeah, worth. Yeah, euro worth, yeah, I'm sorry. And, um, but it's interesting to see this kind of collectors also within the region of France. Mm. And uh, once again, so we're always talking about, uh, we're obsessed with Paris, but you've got also wealthy collectors in the region of France, it's a big country, and also we have, uh, uh, you, know, um, you know, a lot of interesting people in the regions of France. And uh, <laughs> it's not only the choice from, you know, outside France. Yes, businessmen all over France, yeah. and the um, Gary Affa is not always excellent. You have three or four very international mm -hmm. galleries, so all over France, but well, very often these people who are also business owners in this, what we call the province in France, they will come to Paris and buy regularly. So there is a real market in Paris. It's much more well developed than it is in Berlin, for instance. It's not London, but well, something in between. That's a good note to end on, I think. It's not London, but it's something in between <laughs> and something, and something extremely beautiful and gorgeous. Uh, yeah. I wanted to thank my incredibly wonderful thank three you. speakers. Thank you. Our pleasure. And, and Which is by gracias, saying, huh? gracias. <laughs> okay, when I'm saying un gabacho castizo, Wow.
Et, ouais. et, et merci ouais. beaucoup, and vive Paris. Trop fort, Guillaume. Thank you very much. <rire>